Hey there, Wayne. Do you hear me? Hey, good morning. How you going? Good morning. I'm Leo. I'm I'm Mike's friend. Mike hasn't joined the podcast yet. Good morning. It's nice to meet you, brother. I'm so happy that Mike uh, invited you to our podcast. I thought we'd get started and let Mike join on in a, in a few minutes, if you don't mind. Oh, for sure. Let's do it. So, Wayne, uh, the first thing is I want to tell you our podcast is new. <clears throat> it's a weekly podcast in which we've been having fighters on. And my channel is mostly about health and longevity, but especially for ex-athletes. But we're also interested in like performance enhancement, nutrition and stuff like that for fighting. So uh, yeah. last week, our guest was Rich Franklin, and we're very honored to have you on this week. Hey, very exciting. Uh, the first thing is, Wayne, I wanted to ask you, do people ever call you John by accident? Even my own father. He's really? like, hey, John, John, I mean, I mean, I mean Wayne. <laughs> Yeah, Does he really? ones that has stuck now. Did you grow up, uh, just a bit of background, because I've heard you mention, of course, your father, God rest his soul. I know you two were very close. Did you grow up with two, in a two-parent household? Uh, yes. Um, both my mom, mother and father are uh, jockeys. Uh, so in the horse racing industry until I was 18. Uh, and then, yeah, growing up, I, I wanted nothing to do with horses. Uh, my parents weren't had nothing to do with combat sports. It was just... Uh, a thing that uh, excited me for watching movies and Monkey Magic and Karate Kid and Van Damme. So it was, it was sort of my own journey that I, I decided to go on. And now it's, um, yeah, it's quite humbling to see my kids follow in my footsteps. So yeah, the horses, the horse racing industry sort of just didn't, didn't excite me. Yeah, I know about your children also. I wanted to ask you about them later. But so you got you got basically inspired. You always say in your interviews by those initial, I guess you grew up in the 80s. So in the 80s, they were very popular, the martial arts movies. So oh, like a lot of us, I was like that also when I was a kid, obviously never never went that much into it. But as a, a five-year-old, six-year-old, I was reading about Demak and Shaolin Kung Fu. And, you know, there, were, there are some books every once in a while. So I wanted to ask you one thing. You joined, you started first with Taekwondo. The first thing yes. I wanted to ask you about Taekwondo in Brisbane is you only did it for a year. Hey, Mike, welcome to the show. What's up, everybody? What's up, JWP? Hey, good morning. Good morning. Great yeah. to have you on, Mike. So I was just Very asking, crazy. I was just asking Wayne about when you did Taekwondo. Did it did it affect you? I know you only did it for a year, but did it change at all your style later on as a kickboxer? Because I know Taekwondo has a very different kind of striking, especially kicking. I started with Taekwondo, so there was nothing to compare it to when I, when I first started. Um, so growing up in the country, I, I lived on farms. Uh, we were always away from civilization. We were always stuck with myself, like being an only child. And then uh, my, my getaway was watching the movies and, and um, uh, imagining myself in this faraway land, learning either kung fu, karate, uh, anything to do with uh, combat sports. Um, I, knew, I knew I wanted to be a, a fighter of some sort of Art, but I'm, I didn't know what. Uh, and then uh, when we, uh, at the age of eleven, we moved to Brisbane, which is the, the city here in Australia. And then uh, there was there was a Taekwondo school that was only uh, four streets away from my house, so it was the first time getting permission from my parents to leave home at night time and come back by myself. And um, I, I started this journey. I went about a year and a half doing Taekwondo, doing my carters and and uh, I wearing my gi and snapping the pads, and it was it was such a, a cool experience. I felt like a superhero. And then unfortunately the Taekwondo school wasn't very successful and ended up eventually moving. I was like, oh no, I wanted to go to Korea. I wanted to be a Taekwondo black belt. I wanted to do all these, uh, these things. And then, uh, um, but luckily for me, where the, the, the hall that the Taekwondo school was in, um, uh, Thai boxing ended up moving into the same hall. So I thought, oh, I'll try this Thai, this Thai boxing. Um, it's not Taekwondo, but I'll give it a go and see what happens. And then uh, I did my first class and I thought, this is crazy. This is so much better. Uh, I can punch to the head. I can do knees. We can do all the fussy kicks still. And then as I progressed and opened my own gym, um, I still incorporate a lot of the Taekwondo kicks uh, just for fun. It's so cool to be able to do a spinning kick or a, a jumping back kick. Or um, Even though Thai boxing is very raw, uh, that Taekwondo brings an extra element. Uh, it might be ineffective, come fight time but at the same time just to be able to do a, a jumping back kick on the bag or, or a spinning heel kick on, on, on the on clapper pad it's um just makes you feel like you're out of the movies yourself it's, it's so cool when um you know it, it seems like your life has a lot of wonderful uh, lucky coincidences one of them oh, is the same. fact that the, yeah that the taekwondo gym closed if it didn't close you might have went into taekwondo spent a bunch of years doing that and never been that elite uh, teenage athlete in kickboxing you might have been doing like katas instead in the yeah. olympics right 
Oh, oh big time. And Get then, and, yeah. and then the second, uh, the yeah. second but before we leave the subject, I want to ask you something, because this bothered me when I was young too. When I first got into a street fight, maybe when I was, well, actually I was in lower school, probably a young kid in school. I tried my Taekwondo and some of it I noticed wasn't that effective, you know? Yeah. So I'm curious what, at what stage did you, because you were watching Van Damme movies and those kind of movies when you were young. And I know that's where you learned about the Thai boxing, but you had done Taekwondo. Did you ever get suspicious that a lot of these martial arts in the 90s and 80s weren't real like I did or get upset about Taekwondo not being that effective? Oh, at 11 years old, um, uh, I remember going to my first grading and then did my carters and, and did my forms and, and passed my test, got my yellow belt. And then I stayed to the very end to watch the black belts. And then the black belts were, were uh, breaking boards and uh, uh, breaking roof tiles. And I was like, holy God, this, this is amazing. Look at these guys go. Don't give me one board, give me three. I'm thinking, holy crap, there's no way he's going to be able to break through three boards. And sure enough, pow. I'm like, whoa, these guys are superheroes. This is amazing. Um, so in my eyes, this was the greatest martial arts that could ever possibly be formed on earth. Um, to be able to break through wood with a single strike, it's like this is this is stuff of uh, legends. And then uh, it wasn't until later on when I started to boxing that um, I realized how important punching to the head was and more realistic it was. Uh, but at at 11 years old, you're very impressionable. So to, to see someone jumping through there with a flying side kick and, and, and break boards, it's like, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's very surreal to see real life superheroes in, in, um, at that age anyway. But, uh, I was, no, no, I, was, no, no. I was doing things like Thank iron you. palm. I don't know if you remember iron palm, the, con the, the oh, thing where they would, we would hit our hands on like, uh, I guess they were contained rice, like rice bags, and you yeah. would put a certain certain kind of ointment on your hand called the uh, Dao Jia or something like that. Anyway, there were a, a bit of confusing stuff along the way, but I'm glad you got into kickboxing early. Yeah. Soon. Now, I want to jump in and ask if I can, Leo, just one quick question for John, selfishly, but also you might like this as a dad. I yeah. have two little girls. John, you also have children and you're a coach. You run a school, but you're a lifelong martial artist. Now, I asked this question of Ronda Rousey a few years back. On the birth of my first daughter, I said, who's six now? I said, hey, Rhonda, I said, when should I get my daughter into judo? And she said, well, listen, like, you know, Ronda Rousey, Olympic judo bronze medalist, by the way, UFC world champion, for those who don't know. And she said, honestly, she said, start your daughters in a traditional martial arts, like uh, karate, taekwondo, something like that, where they learn body awareness, they learn to put on a gi, they learn to bow, they learn how to learn. First, she yes. said maybe around eight years old or so, depending on maturity, then consider putting them into like a judo or jujitsu school where they start to have that close combat. So teach them kind of the distance, the timing, and the ability to learn, which I, I really enjoyed that part of it. But what is your thought from all your experiences wearing all the hats that you've had? What do you think is the right way as it now we're three dads here also and, and many others, but from an educational standpoint, what do you think is the best way to introduce children to the sport? Uh, we, we started the Thai boxing at about seven, eight years old at, at my gym. And then okay. April last year, we started incorporating uh, the Jiu Jitsu into our classes with our, our Brazilian professor, uh, Daniel. And then um, we asked him, Hey, what, what age do you start the kids? He goes, I start the kids at four. I said, like, four, really? Geez, you must have so much patience. Um, you're almost yeah. like the, 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 king, the, the child whisperer. They <laughs> 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 had to contain the kids from going crazy for that whole 45 minutes. Um, but, then, but then seeing him roll with the kids and seeing uh, like the human chess, um, just dissecting how to grab, how to hold the wrist, how to do all sorts of things. Uh, it's such a more gentle art than Thai boxing where you're constantly hitting the pads and, and not having your bones quite formed correctly just, just at, a, at that young age. I think the jiu-jitsu is a, a much better uh, opportunity to, to start getting into that mindset, having that focus. And uh, my daughter, is, uh, she's seven now and started competing when she was six. So just the idea of getting on the mats and have, uh, having that fear of competing in front of a, a large crowd. And, and then uh, she's at that age where she has to rest, wrestle boys and, and to see the excitement of her being able to tap out boys and, and to win a gold medal against them, uh, the boys in her division is just, uh, yeah, words can't describe that, the, the happiness that a little girl can know that she has the ability to, to not be just um, stuck with uh, the stereotype of, oh, girls will play with dolls. Like to, for her to be able to choke out a boy and make him tap, is, uh, you, you see the spring in her step and the confidence in, in, her, in her smile that, that she knows that she's a, a little beast. 
Um, Wayne, I know you're not a grappler, but do you you were you were sort of uh, insinuating that the grappling is less damaging to the body, so maybe you can start that earlier. But also, do you okay. think that the the grappling has a sort of intuitive component and maybe potentially more skill development and requires like starting earlier to get really used to it it, and striking maybe someone can pick up older or do you think that's not true they're equal i think uh yeah and anything to do with um uh, like i said so uh anything that's non-contacted especially the younger ages because because like i said wrists and knees and elbows and uh, all that sort of thing they're all very damage very supple very supple whereas um when the, the kids are rolling with the BJJ, mm. um, it seems like it's such a dissected, all right, hand here, come through, grab this, do that. It's all broken down in, in the baby steps. So, uh, yeah, a lot less trauma on the body, especially for the, the younger younger kids. Wayne, what do you attribute your quick rise in competitive? I mean, you. Uh, by the way, Mike, he competed for the first time when he was eight, right, Wayne? Eight was... Uh, the- 11. Oh, 11. Okay. I thought yeah, 11. it might have been you were talking about your daughter or something. But yeah, okay. my daughter was eight. Oh, that was, that must be what it was. So you competed very early and you, you gained the Australian title and the South Pacific title by the age of, I think, 19, right? What do you yeah, attribute so the, the to your quick success? Oh, yeah. uh, uh, just the, the yeah. hunger to want to be, to be a champion. Uh, I so wanted the to be, be an only child and being on farms and um, uh, just just this mindset is oh, I want to I want to be a champion. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, like I was saying before, on, on what style was going to be whether it be kung fu, karate, taekwondo, boxing, uh, even WWE. Oh, maybe I'll be a wrestler like Hulk Hogan, as he was very influential back then. Um, anything to do that had the uh, form of combat in, in a ring. Uh, there was no cages back then, so it was all ring stuff. So just to be a um, uh, a world-renowned fighter of some 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 sort, and then um, once I had the opportunity to start training, it's like, oh, this is it. This is it. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna be the best. I don't wanna just be a good. I wanna be uh, world-renowned. I want people to know my name, and that was from eleven. And then when I started Thai boxing at the age of thirteen, um, and about the same time the movie Kickboxer came out of Van Dam, and it, it told the story of a gentleman going to Thailand and fighting the, the Tong Po and the, the scariest Thai. I was like, that's, that's me. I want to go to Thailand now. I have to fight Thais. So from the age of 13, I told myself, uh, I, I can't fight another Westerner for a world title if I want to be, uh, if I want the respect from people. If I want a world title, it has to be against a Thai. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm so lucky that out of my 10 world titles, four of them against uh, a world-class Thais. So, so I've got to live my dream many times over. But what I want to ask you is this. So I know more about like powerlifting and strength sports. I'm actually an arm wrestler myself. In those sports, if you're, if, even if you love the sport really just, and it's, it's your entire life and you spend 10 years at it, there's a genetic limitation for some people. Some people don't have the kind of muscle fiber where they can be that powerful or explosive. Do you think that that's as similar in like combat sports or do genetics matter a little bit less because there's so many variables at play that your discipline and hard work and ambition can push you further to the to the elite uh, level? I mean, at the elite level that you were at, the world champions. Is there a genetic yeah. barrier? Uh, definitely. I think uh, okay. owning a gym... I, I get to teach people every single day and then some people pick it up like that. Other people, you're there for a year and you're still t- teaching the basics and then every day it feels like day one again. Um, so some people just have a a, a different destiny, I guess. Um, yeah. yeah, some people you feel so so sad for. It's like, oh man, just stop. Please just stop. This is wasting my time. But uh, they come in every day still. You're still trying to help them become the best person that they can possibly be. But um, other people just boom, all, all of a sudden they, they get it. So I'm, I'm so, not so sure say, of the genetics. Say, say, for example, at your gym, say you have a new guy came in who doesn't know how to fight and he, he, he did some bag work or something like that. What would make you most impressed with the talent? Is it speed, power of strikes or like like what you're talking about, the skill acquisition, how quickly they can learn? Yeah, what if, you show somebody, you? if you can show someone a technique and, and, and they pick it up straight away, it definitely helps. So, mm-hmm. so the tires used to tell me... Um, Okay, I want to teach you five things. We're going to learn one. We're going to learn two. You got to teach them three, but they already forget one. It's like, when are we going to get the five? If you keep forgetting one and two, when are we going to get the five? So other people just pick it up, boom, 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 boom. And other people, you're stuck on one and two, one and two, one and two. So, um, yeah, it's, it's so bizarre how some people just uh, are naturally born to be 
competitive and other people were just, uh, yeah, unfortunately, if it, was, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. So, yeah. On so, that same topic, John, what do you think about, and you've probably seen this before, an athlete who's athletically gifted, great striking, great form, great timing, even has power, but they can't take a shot. They just, no. they're just not built. And, and to Leo's point, a genetic limiting factor, they cannot absorb the contact. When you have another fighter like a Chris Lieben, who I love, that kid could absorb more contact than most other athletes out there. And I think Lieben himself would say he wasn't the most technical fighter you've ever seen for sure. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't a great athlete. He wasn't a great technician, but man, that kid could fight. That would, I think, uh, Leo, that would be one of the biggest genetic genetic limiting factor that I, I've certainly seen is some individuals, they're just not built for combat, mm -hmm. but they should still live the life of a martial artist, right? Be in the gym, train, master their craft, like do all the beautiful things that come from it. What do you, what do you think about that, John? Uh, I, I think um, through combat sports as well, a lot of people will start off with the super strong chin. And once they get dropped once, they lose that elasticity in, in their jaw. And then you just got to tap them and, and they go down. So uh, some people are, 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 are born to be fighters. Other people want to be fighters. But unfortunately, um, two circumstances um, have to finish their career a lot earlier because uh, circumstances. Uh, yeah, it's... Um, Chuck Liddell, it, it, maybe? It, like, yeah, exactly. At one time, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, same as uh, I, I was very lucky to fight Dwayne Ludwig. And um, uh, he must have suffered something similar because he, he has all the skills in the world. And then when we fought, um, when you watch the video, I just tap him. I, I wasn't even a hard hit, and he just dropped. And then you could see the frustration on his face because it wasn't hard hits, but at the same time, he had no control over his legs, and his legs would just give out every time. So yeah. um, for me, for me, it was very good because I got the win. But for him, I could see it was very, uh, very frustrating that uh, he was taking these minimal shots, but the, the his just his body wouldn't stand up to them. So it's yeah, funny. It I can give you some bizarre. I'll give you some backstory. I, I'm I'm good friends with, with Dwayne and the, yeah. you guys fought prior to me meeting Dwayne. I actually coached Dwayne towards the end of his career as, as his you know weight yeah. management coach. And the way he used to cut weight was horrible. And he actually said the one of the time when he fought you, and this is, you know, of course, John Wayne Parr is one of the greatest in the world for sure. And he cut weight the same way for your fight as he did for all of his other fights, which is just destroying his body, suffering, putting on plastics, running through the city. Did you fight in, in Asia? Where did you guys fight? Yeah, we fought in Japan on uh, K1. We fought in running, through the, running through Japan with the plastic suit on. Like, And this, athletes still do that to, to today. You, you know that for sure. So he, he had mentioned that he just couldn't take the big shots anymore because he had destroyed his body. So maybe it was from taking other big shots because Lord knows Dwayne fight a lot, fought a lot of monsters. But also I've seen a lot of athletes, we, what happens is they reduce the, the fluid that surrounds the brain, right? So when you have a hard weight cut, your body simply does not have the fluid. So the brain is now rattling. So it, it's a brain on skull collision. So you hit and it, it's not the typical knockout the, the, through the, the nerve cluster, right? It's the knockout of the secondary collision. It's the passenger in the car who hits the inside of the car. They crack their head on the windshield. That was happening to an athlete like Dwayne, in my opinion, right? I wasn't there for it. But also a lot of other athletes may be listening right now. And I know, John, and maybe later on, we'll talk more about the weight cuts, 1FC versus like UFC or the traditional weight cutting style. Um, man, that, that's a whole nother conversation, by the way. And I think a lot of athletes have suffered. Their careers have been cut short because of improper weight management, weight cutting and rehydration. And then they get the baseball bat swung at their skull for mm -hmm. three, five, 10 rounds, however many, yeah. many rounds it's going to be, right? Yes. Actually, yeah, Wayne, yeah. I, had a, I had a bunch of questions to follow up on, on what Mike said about this. The first one is, because I don't know as much about Muay Thai, is are knockouts in Muay Thai as common as in Western boxing, which you also compete in? Oh, for sure. Uh, so we as common the or more uh, common? You can grab someone and pull it, their, their face down under your knee. You can, you can use elbows. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Uh, it's very brutal. So, um, so also, do the do the knockouts usually happen from one powerful strike or from like chipping away at someone's head over over a period of rounds? Uh, but uh, you can, yeah, you can sort of uh, accumulation of shots or, or that one good strike that puts them down straight away. So, and then uh, now that we're implementing MMA gloves into Muay Thai, it's even more brutal again. So, um, just one good hit, and all of a sudden, yeah, you're looking up at the lights, going, "Oh no!" 
no. <laughs> wow. yeah. and, and fighters tend to become easier to knock out over their career. Like as they get knocked uh, out, it progresses, huh? From, from the studies that I've, I've read, uh, definitely. Uh, once, like I said, once you cop that good, good shot on the jaw and, and your, your, uh, the elasticity goes in your jaw and then all it takes is a simple tap and all of a sudden you're out. So, um, yeah, it's all got to do with the, the wiring and uh, having glitches in the, in the system. <laughs> so, you, yeah, you, men- you mentioned knees and elbows when you were talking about knockouts. Is, is the knee the most powerful strike in Muay Thai? Uh, definitely. Uh, uh, one, one of one off, one off. Uh, the kicks are quite brutal as well, especially once you condition your shin. So you, you have two little baseball bats under, under your knees. So yeah, to, to throw a kick as hard as you can to, to, to the body or to land flush across the ribs or even the neck. Um, I, I want to ask you, yeah. but before we do, we're skipping ahead. Tell me about Richard uh, Vell. I don't know how to pronounce his Richard name. Vell. The other Richard beautiful Vell. coincidence of your life, which by the way, I just want to say, it's incredible how one person can change somebody's life so much. <laughs> And I think this story should inspire people who are listening to make that effort for some young kid out there someday. But tell us about yeah. Richard, how it changed your life. Um, so I have a lot of people that, uh, that come onto my social media and I always hit him up on the DMs. And then I, I always tell them, I always fight impressively. Yeah, you might be the first fight of the card or you might be in the middle of the card, but, but try and fight the most exciting fight that you can possibly fight every single time because you never know who's going to be in the crowd. And then... Um, through a friend of a friend, I got to meet a gentleman called Richard Bell, who's a Thai man who owns a restaurant here in Australia, uh, called Bunshu. And then uh, we got introduced to each other. And then he, he offered me a sponsorship of coming down to his restaurant once a week to, for a free free meal. And then uh, the more that we started uh, associating with each other, uh, we, we built up a re- relationship. And then one one day a week for a free meal ended up turning into seven days a week. I, I, uh, it was only a 10-minute walk from my house to his restaurant. So I'd go and sit in the, in the, in the kitchen and uh, sit on a, a, a couple of uh, empty tubs while he'd prepare the chicken and prepare all the food in the back. And we'd talk about this mystical place called Thailand where uh, Muay Thai was a national sport. And it's like, oh, man, this place sounds amazing. They, they, instead of – in Australia, we play football and cricket. And, and in Thailand, they, 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 they fight as a national sport. It's like, I've got to go to this place. This sounds amazing. Um, and then I had about another – three or four more fights uh, for the, the South Pacific title that we're talking about before. Mm-hmm. I, I got dropped in the second round and then I, I hung on, hung on, hung on and ended up winning by a fifth round knockout, which was enough to impress Richard Bell to, um, to, uh, to sponsor me to go and live in Thailand for the six months. So, uh, no, so I won the South Pacific title and the next day I took the, the, the belt down to the restaurant to show, show Richard to say, yes, we did it as, as, a, as a team. And then he, he pulled me aside. We sat on a table just privately and he asked me, he said, oh, last night you fought very impressive. Uh, I, I think you had the heart to go all the way to be, become a champion. Uh, how would you like to go to Thailand and learn from the very best? Oh, that'd be amazing. I'd, I'd love to go to Thailand. And he grabbed me by the wrist and, and we walked um, down the end of the street to where a travel agent was. Um, I want to book a, a, a one-way ticket for a, a six-month open ticket. He said, with this ticket, you can come home whenever you want. But um, if you if you got to promise me that you're going to stay six months, you can come home. But uh, if you come home before the six months, you'll you'll make me very disappointed. But if you can stay six months, you'll make me very proud. Mm. So I'll do it. I'll, I'll last six months. I, I swear. I swear. So I went over. I had five fights, five wins. Um, come back to Australia again. Started working in Richard's kitchen, cleaning plates and washing dishes, and not having any plan B as such. Uh, and then. Uh, about a month after I got back to Australia, the, the camp that I was training at, they they ran Richard. Said, oh, this kid's got um, a little bit of talent. We we believe he can go all the way. Is it possible to send him back to Thailand again so we, we can keep continuing the training and the fighting? Mm-hmm. And then uh, Richard pulled me aside again. Hey, you want to go back to Thailand? Of course, of course I do. And he said, okay. So the first the first year we did six months, which was cute. Um, but but now if you want to get more serious, you have to promise me one year, one year. Oh, that's a long time. So, uh, the same deal as before. It's an open ticket. You can come home whenever you want. But if you can last one year, you make me very proud. All right, done. I'll, I'll go. I'll go. I'll go. And that was 1997. Ended up having nine fights that year. Started fighting in all the big stadiums and uh, making the front covers of the magazines and fighting on TV and and uh, having ties high five me in the street as I'm as I'm look at the shops. Um, this is before social media and iPhones and uh, it was it was um, definitely a different era back then. 
Yeah, just to point out to the audience, I mean, the first time I went to Thailand was in 2001. And even at that time, there weren't that many Westerners there. There was like in Pattaya, the foreigners and stuff. But I imagine in 1996 and 97, Thailand was very different. Like when I went in 2001, you could go to villages like outside, I don't know which city it was, but you could go to villages and you would see like people uh, weaving, rural people with tribal people, their old fashioned lifestyle. What was it like in the 90s? What was your living condition? I heard you mention it before, but I find it fascinating. What were you living like how are you using the bathroom how are you eating how are you sleeping what was it like yeah so so the when i first arrived uh, i stayed with richard's family for the first three months um i shared a double bed with his brother um sleeping side by side next to a gentleman i'd never met before but uh i wanted to become a star so i was prepared to sleep with some dude i'd never met before um <laughs> and then and then uh, after about three months i uh, sang in patio it was a very western um uh, uh, influence. Um, everyone spoke English. Even I was in Thailand, everyone spoke English and the Western food and the whole business. And I didn't feel like I was excelling. I wasn't getting anywhere. I wasn't get. No one was teaching me. I was just in the bag by myself, kicking. Oh. Even I was in Thailand, I was not much was happening. Oh. So after three months, um, I thought, oh, I got, I, this, I, I got to, I got to go to another gym. I'm not doing it as well as I thought I was going to go. And it was just so happened that a superstar named Sang Ten Noi came to Australia. It happened to fight in my hometown. Um, and he he met Richard Bill while he was here. So him and his trainer, um, they, they started making a relationship with Richard. And, and then Richard uh, talked them into sending me to, to their camp. Um, so I was the first Westerner they ever accepted. So when they arrived back in Thailand, they jumped in the car. They came and picked me up. They took me back to their camp in Bangkok. And... Uh, they were showing me around the camp. Take it, they took me to the boxer room where all, all the fighters sleep on a wooden floor side by side like a dorm. Wow. And it's like, oh, okay, this is this is your living conditions. This is where you're going to be sleeping. Wow. I was like, oh, my God, this is rough. No bed, no mattress. Like, I, I didn't mind sharing a mattress, but there, this was no mattress at all. <laughs> I was like, oh, man. And then uh, with the toilets, we don't, we don't have a normal Western uh, sit-down toilet. It's a, it's a squatting toilet where you got a, a hole with the, some two-foot two pegs. And uh, the first thing I noticed was there's no toilet paper. I was like, hey, what do I do here? There's a, there's a little blue tub that, that floats on top of the water. So you gotta you got to try and um, pour the water into your hand so you get a, 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 a good ratio of, of water to hand to skin. Otherwise, you're going to have very stinky, <laughs> so very, very stinky fingers. <laughs> so, uh, and then, By the um, way, yeah, Mike, had- just to explain, the reason why I'm laughing is because in Dubai in the 90s, we still had those toilets. Yeah. So I, I grew up in Dubai a little bit in the 90s and we had the same product. There's no toilet paper, there's water. And he's explaining it exactly. You have yeah. that, the right texture. It's, yeah, yeah. It's like you got to need enough water. It's funny. And then, it's like uh, a hole that you stand on. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah exactly. It's the same one. And then... Um, and especially after a hard fight, you have to squat over these toilets and your thighs are all aching and it's very hard to get into the squat position with sore thighs. <laughs> so every, every, if you have a hard fight, or oh, if you want someone to have a hard fight, you say, oh, he's going to have a hard time going to the toilet tomorrow. <laughs> um, now, now, Wayne, just explain to us at this time in the in the late nineties, th- there were some other Westerners who did compete in Thailand. The one that I know his name of, I know because of you, is uh, Raymond Deckers, who was a yes, Dutch he, a competitor. Now, how many how many competitors were there before you? Because I think you were one of the first that ever got a Thai championship as a Westerner, right? Uh, oh, one one of uh, there's a gentleman called Danny Bill. He was also from France. Um, he was a super duper duper star. Him and him and Raymond Deckers were the two most influential Westerners at the time. Um, they were going to Thailand, fighting the, the champions, winning, and not only just winning, but knocking out the Thais. So they were a, a big influence to show that um, that we could win with the, with the right training and, and the right uh, mental focus. That uh, they they were beatable. Yes. So um, they they sort of inspired me to show me that. Uh, Every other Westerner would just get destroyed within one or two rounds from the from the ties, and these are the guys that could actually stand there and trade and, and then win. So it's like, oh, I got to be like these guys. I got to I got to follow them. And back then there was no phones or YouTube. You couldn't study them. It was all VHSs. So um, now you get your hands in a good good VHS. So it's like, oh, this is gold. So it was very inspiring to to see them win and and to 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 show that. Uh, yeah, it's not all suicide. When you sign up to fight a tie, sometimes you you can come out victorious. Now, did these we guys don't... train at? Sorry, did these guys train at Thai camps, or did they train in the Netherlands and France and then go fight in Thailand? 
uh, majority of the time that they'd arrive in Thailand, maybe two or three weeks before the fight, okay. have their fight and then go back home. So you and were the first Westerner self- to train at a Thai camp? Uh, one of the first Westerners to live in the Thai camp full time. Wow. So the, I, I lived in my camp for uh, four years. So then, then the Thais used to say to me, you're, you're the first guy to, to live on the circuit and fight for the, um, uh, to, to, to live like a Thai pretty much. I, I was a white version of one of them. So uh, I learned how to speak the language. I learned how the all the customs. I, I learned the um, just the, the way of life of a Thai, which was so um, yeah, humbling uh, to to, li- to sleep on a floor and to, to eat on the floor. We had no furniture whatsoever. So every time we ate, we'd sit on the the, the uh, either concrete or the tiles, or uh, it, it was it was so tough. But at the same time, it, was, it, was, it, it inspired you to want to be great because you didn't want to live in, in those conditions anymore. You wanted to hopefully one day own a house and own a bed and have hot water and, and have a table to sit on and have the, your meals. And um, Being poor definitely helps encourage you to be, want to be, be somebody. Um, I think that's yeah. one of the main actions uh, to, to wanting to be great is to have absolutely nothing and then to want everything. So Did you guys- the only way to achieve that was through, through knocking people out. And um, yeah, I was very lucky to, to knock a lot of people out. <laughs> I, I got I want to jump in real quick. I'm, I'm curious, and I, I know I came in a couple minutes late. Did you cover John's background growing up? Because I'm really curious how you had the passion, John, to give up a Western lifestyle in Australia to go and sleep on the floor, sleep in a bed with a stranger, to shit in the hole and wipe your ass with yeah. your hand, right? What is the motivating factor to go and do that? Was that a regression? Did you take the step back? Was your home life growing up that hard? And I, I know, you know, Leo's very well researched. So maybe I missed that part, but I'm, I'm fascinated in what got you to the point mentally, because you're 17, 18, 19 years old, kids these days, Man, if you take their iPhone away from them for 30 seconds, they're going to yeah. fucking cry and piss their pants. What made you so mentally resilient to do this? And and maybe, Leo, if, if you can kind of jump in a little bit. I'm just I'm super fascinated. I'm curious, too. Yeah. With how this how this happened, what drove you to do this? Yeah, from approximately the age of uh, four years old, I was... Uh... I was fanatic about martial arts. Uh, all I, I just wanted to be a fighter. And then the more movies came out, I'd go to the video store, I'd go to the martial arts section, mm. I'd get something from the 70s or the 80s, or just I'd watch whatever I could, anything to do with fighting. Mm. Uh, ninjas, uh, wrestling, like I said before, uh, anything to do with a gi, anything to do with a ring. Um, and then when the opportunity to start training myself, um, uh, so I was that kid that every time I had a birthday, every time I blew out the can- candles, or I tell myself, uh, hopefully one day I can be a world champion. Wow. Uh, every time I look up in the sky and see a one star, my my only wish, I, one day I want to be a world champion. And then that uh, that's all that ever mattered to me. Nothing is nothing. I, I, I was born to fight. I know I was. Um, at, and then uh, having all these opportunities and meeting all these influential people to open up some doors. Uh, and when the opportunity came to Thailand, there was no way that I was going to say no because this, this is, I wanted this more than anything. I wanted this. I wanted to be a, a world champion more than I wanted to live. Um, it's the only uh, thing that mattered to me. And then, um, so sleeping on the floor was nothing. I was happy to sleep outside. I sleep in a doghouse. Sleep in uh, whatever conditions that were necessary for me to become who I wanted to become. Um, nothing was going to stop me from from achieving my dream, my destiny. Um, and then, yeah, so I'm very, very humbled how life ended up turning out. Winning 10 world titles, not just one, but 10, is uh, such a dream come true. And I'm, I'm so lucky and so blessed to be able to, to be where I am today. I'm curious about one thing. How did your, so you had this driving ambition yourself as a child. How did your parents, yes. did your parents encourage it, support it? Did they fuel your fire a little bit? How did, and, and how do you, Given that you had that experience, how do you do that for your children also? How do you think, like, if you had a child who would love something, how would you encourage them? What's the best way to do it? Because you ended up perfectly. I, I'm assuming your parents did something wonderful. Uh, yes, yeah, so and my parents were uh, the horse trainers uh, living on farms. Uh, we, we, as a kid, we moved a lot as, uh, growing up. So I ended up going to 11 different schools. 
Um, I was always the new kid. So when the movie Karate Kid came out, it was about the gentleman starting a new school, being uh, uh, a bit of a loner, and, yeah. and I could I could very much um, relate. Uh, yeah, relate to the the circumstances that he was under because I was that kid also. Yeah. And then uh, to see him to fight the bullies and multiple attackers and, and still win, it's like oh, I want to be this guy. I want to be the Karate Kid. I want to be Daniel Sun. Um, and, and still, still stay humble as well. So, so through martial arts, uh, yeah, it was just. Um, yeah, but it wasn't it was your, just, par- your parents it, it, weren't it was, like it, uh, no, keeping. No, no. It was all self driven. It was all self motivated. Wow. All it, 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 uh, they wanted me to to be in the horse racing industry, and uh, as much as I like horses, it's like no, nah, I have my own destiny. I want to go in this direction, um, uh, and no one, no one believed in me. I had my first few fights. I, I wasn't that successful i fought some some um i was fighting men at, at, as a teenager and, and i was i was doing okay but i wasn't great and it wasn't until i i went to thailand and started beating the ties that when i came back to australia the first time um just to see my dad just become a, not just my dad but a, a fan um I, i'd given my, my vhs tape of my five fights that i had and then he'd, he'd invite all his friends over and he'd, everyone was sick of watching my fights because every time they went to that <laughs> house, that was, that was the first thing that he put on the TV and, and then make them sit through it. Um, and then and me, and my, my, me and my dad got super close um, just through the fighting um, just because he wanted to, to come and support me. And then wherever I fought in Australia, he'd come and um, cheer me on and he even come to Japan to, to watch one of my K1 fights against Albert Krauss. Um, yeah, it was so cool to... God Not just because cool. you have your you have your father son relationship, but when you when your dad's your fan, uh, and then we can become super tight. Um, every time I have a phone call, if I was overseas, I would try and give him a call and know the results. And um, we, when the big uh, pay per view fights would come on TV, I would go to his house and we sit on the couch together and just have that bond through um, combat. It was um, it was it was it was a very very amazing relationship. No. Actually, on this yeah, topic, no. you know, interestingly, uh, and God rest his soul, your father, uh, on this topic, Habib uh, Nurgamenov de- recently had a discussion with Mike Tyson in which he was describing how his father, who was his coach, I guess, how his father yes, yes. would be critical to him after he wins a fight. So he would win a fight, he would call him, he wouldn't hear a congratulations or a compliment, he would hear, you missed this in one round. When I was listening to your interviews, I heard a similar style of criticism from the Thai trainers you had in Thailand, that was their culture, it was sort of not to give compliments and so on. Do you do you compliment your, your children? Because I know your daughter is a Muay Thai fighter and your son is a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu fighter. How do you take it with them? Do you criticize after their sparring sessions or do you compliment? What do you think is the best way? Uh, definitely uh, trying to raise them up. Uh, being in Thailand and getting absolutely slaughtered after every fight. So there was no praise. There was no congratulations. There was no, you did amazing. Even when I fought perfect, um, I would still get in trouble. That was terrible. That was crap. Why were you showing off? You were winning so easy, but why didn't you? Do, why didn't you knock him out? Why did you go to the points? Um, and no matter what you did, you, no matter what happened. It, uh, so one fight, um, I went to fight the famous stadium called uh, Lumpini in, in uh, Bangkok, and I. That's uh, the biggest won, stadium, was, right? Yeah, That's one of the biggest stadiums in yeah. Bangkok. Yes. Um, uh, my birthday was on the twenty fifth, and I was fighting at Lumpini on the on the thirtieth. So I had the. Um, Train through my my twenty first birthday. I had to train through my twenty first birthday, and everything. Went, uh, it was just so uh, heartbreaking because growing up, you think you're twenty one. I'm gonna have a big party, and all my friends are gonna come, and gonna get super drunk. And here I am in Bangkok, hitting pads on my twenty first birthday, going, "This wasn't supposed to happen." So I thought, I thought to myself, um, so when you when you win by knockout on Thai TV uh, as a as a, a way of uh, complimenting you, they, they give you a gold chain. So laying in bed the night before the fight, I thought, I'm going to knock this guy out so I can give myself a, a gold chain for my own birthday, for my 21st. So I got out there, I was feeling, feeling uh, looking for my shots and started landing, seeing him, I was hurting him. And I ended up knocking him out in round two and then um, come down off the ring and then the ties all had these sad looks on their face. And they said, oh, why'd you knock him out so early for? Well, we're yelling at you, stop us, lay down, let the goat, let, let us... Uh, let us get a bet on uh, because you knocked him out so early. You were, you were the favorite straight away. So we couldn't bet. So that whole six week camp was a waste of time because we didn't get the, the <laughs> bet one dollar on you. Um, why didn't you knock him out round uh, four or five? Well, we could have lose the first couple, get better odds. 
It's like, this is my, this is my thing. This, um, like even though I won by knockout, I still got absolutely destroyed on the way home. Just telling me how I was a loser, and even because I knocked him out too fast. <laughs> so now, now learning from those experiences, I, I learned how devastating and how heartbroken I was to be criticised after an amazing performance. Mm-hmm. So from now, I, I try and I try and. Um, put positivities to tell them um, all the things they did right. And then after a couple of days, say, okay, okay, let's work on this because I noticed you're doing this, yeah. this, this. But at the time, especially when you're so happy after a win, you, you want to, you want people to uh, congratulate you. The last thing you want to do is cop criticism, especially when you're on such a high from, from coming down. And um, yeah, it was, it was so heartbreaking to, to, to do everything right and get the result that you wanted and to, to be celebrated and then just cop criticism the whole way home is just like so so heartbreaking it's um but it just sucked when you bring up another idiosyncrasy of muay thai which is that in thailand uh muay thai is a very active sport in which people bet on so because of the betting which i by the way i never knew this until i was learning about you i didn't even know this so apparently because of the structure of the bets fighters are actually trying just like you said to last certain rounds they try to knock people out in later rounds like the yes. first three rounds is not as good usually they, it builds up anticipation or something so can you tell us like to the audience who doesn't know about this how does betting on the fights change the nature of the fights like as compared to the ufc fights where that isn't a main draw you know motivator for the fighters yes yeah, so, uh, a lot of the ties will tell you uh Try, try and lose the first two rounds. If you believe that you're more superior than your opponent, uh, lose the first two rounds on, on purpose. So uh, you get better odds. So unlike unlike uh, Western civilization where you have your, your sporting centers and your everything else, uh, uh, everyone in the stadium is their own bookmaker. So after every single round, you see all the hands go up with different, different finger and then uh, everyone's watching. And then you see who's offering the best odds and you try and make eye contact. And once you once you you do a symbol to show that that the bet's on, and then um, yeah, so and then the, the crowd will cheer and cheer and cheer, and sometimes they can influence the the judges as well as to which way they want the fight, the, the direction they want to go. Um, yeah, they they're very uh, influential over who wins and who loses for sure. Um, and yeah, and, and the first two rounds barely score, so you can go out there and, and spend all your pennies, win the first two rounds by a mile. But um, unlike uh, unlike Western style um, mm. in in Thailand, the, the the fight scored it pretty much as a whole. So you can lose the first three rounds, come back really strong four and five, and, and then still win, still still change the outcome mm. of the fight, even though you lost three out of the five rounds. Um, yeah, it makes it very hard. You you can't. That's why the the first two rounds are so slow, because if you gas out in the fourth and the fifth, you've lost the fight. So. It's um yeah definitely a different scoring system and, and frustrating too especially when you've done everything right and then you lose the last round and you lost it's like damn it that's so shit yeah <laughs> but it's just uh, yeah different different country different style you know the Thai language as a foreigner for me it sounds so difficult and uh, and uh, you know I, I'm so impressed you learned the Thai language because you were there for four years continuously so you had to learn it did you ever learn yes. to read the script because what i notice is your right arm i i, I like to study oh, tattoos and your right arm's tattoos are very unusual they seem yes, to be yes. the traditional thai tattoos are they yes, yes. yeah uh, they are right it's, it's, i saw that it's called uh the, the sakyan so it's a it's a steel rod with a little cone and a little uh needle at the end so they dip it into the ink and then it's mm-hmm. like a pull cue where they hold in the hand and and they'll they'll do it all by hand instead of a machine wow. and then um and then once they, that that it's all uh, down my arms, all uh, scriptures. Yeah, that's what I children. noticed. Exactly. I was wondering so, if you could so, read um, the Thai script. Yeah. Um, so, and, and this is a, uh, the Buddhist language. So it's not even Thai language. It's, it's a Buddhist uh-huh. language. So it's not even Thai. So, um, so it, uh, the, the monk that did the tattoo for me was saying, is uh, good luck, good fortune. When I come to the crossroads in life to take the right path, um, and I have uh, two on my back, one I can't get shot and one I can't get stabbed. And since I've had them, I haven't been shot or stabbed. So I'm, I'm guessing. <laughs> I'm guess- <laughs> Perfect. Then you're invulnerable because that's the only way to get to you, I think. <laughs> so, so, tell me something else. The, the Thai society is very like um, about, there's an honor. Honor is very important in the society and, and having saving face and so on. Like, for example, tell you a story that happened to me when I was 12 and I was in Thailand in 2001. I was bargaining with somebody on the street for a fake watch. 
I was, I was 12 years old. I was trying to buy some fake watch. You know, it was, it was cheap, but it was a Cartier fake one. And I, I didn't understand the bargaining style. I was only 12 years old. But I guess I I bargained with him a bit. Then I said the price is too high, and I walked away. As I was walking away, the guy got mad. He was like 20, 20 or 30 years old. He took out a knife. And I had to run. I ran through the cities of Thailand oh, running geez. away because I had offended him without realizing it. I had said something offensive. So I wanted to ask you, how does the pride-focused culture of Thailand affect the way fighters fight and the way maybe the trainers demand fights on the, on the, on the fighters? Is it like a very macho culture where uh, fighters, like if they take a loss, they take it personally and they, they hold it to their honor? Does it, is it different than Western culture of fighting because of that? Uh, so, so with the Thai boxing, um, the camps have to survive off the fighters. There's no other income. So if you, if you, so the deal was, uh, I stay at the camp for free. I train twice a day for free. I get two meals a day for free. And then after I fight, I give the camp 50% of my prize money. Um, not 20, not 30, not 40, but 50%. I give them half of my money every fight. So, uh, and then if you have 10 or 15, 20 fighters and you're getting 50%, so um, that's their main form of income. So the Thais need to, to train um, 100%. Every day you have to train harder than yesterday because uh, they want every single person to become successful. So after you win, hopefully your prize money goes up a little bit. And if you lose, your prize money starts going down. So in the camp's best interest, then they need you to be as strong and as fit and as hard and as possible. So... Uh, so every, every single fight camp is the hardest fight camp of your life because uh, it's not just for yourself, but for the camp to be um, uh, successful as well, I guess. Uh, and and, the, and then the camp and the trainers and the owner of the camp, they take it very personally if you lose. So it's not just you, but um, the whole camp's reputation, especially let's say there's 20 fighters in a camp and then one fighter has a, a bad fight. Um, that the, the camp's name might be Mud for the next couple of months just because of one one person's performance. Oh, that camp's crap. Look at that guy's fight. That fight was terrible. That camp doesn't know what they're doing. And then, um, yeah, so the, like you said, there's so much pride on the line every t- single time the bell rings. Um, you're not just doing it for yourself. You, you're doing it for, for everyone that's helped you prepare for that fight. Um, yeah, just a different culture. It's, it's not like a – in, in, in Western culture, you have your fight, you have your win, you celebrate, but over there – um, you're not just fighting for yourself, but you're fighting for for everyone to to yeah to to lift everyone's name, not just yours, but the the whole camps. So, but it's really interesting. Uh, yeah, a lot, a, lot, a lot more uh, yeah, a lot, a lot more difficult than um, yes, yeah, so it's it's different and so hard. But Wayne, sometimes when you talk about Thai culture, you say like uh, one of the great things about it is like it's less materialistic. So even though they live in what's con- used to be considered a third world country, a lot of people are happy, joyous and free. Whereas, you, and, and like you mentioned before, like there's almost no homeless there. There's homeless in the West. So you're, you're talking about like uh, they're usually less materialistic, more uh, giving, more communal. If one guy makes it, he takes care of his friends, stuff like that. So does that not apply as much to the fight camp because it's more like a business? Or because it, it seems more money driven and they're they're holding you to what you make, you know, on each uh, fight? Well, the, the owners of the camp, uh, they're very uh, – it's their business model for, for all their fighters to be successful. But as as fighters, we're all, we're all brothers. Um, oh so so back fighters. in the 90s – Back in the 90s, uh, the, the females weren't allowed to fight yet. They weren't allowed to touch the ring. There's signs. There were signs at the big stadiums where it says no female. They're not even allowed to, to lean against the ring. Otherwise, it's going to uh, make them the ring uh, uh, bad luck where lots of cuts. Um, so the, no, no female interaction whatsoever, especially no fights at all for the girls. Uh, uh, and then, uh, yeah, so... Yeah, it's just just a uh, different different culture. Just uh, they they want you to yeah. Would, would, let's say let's say I I, I, went, I have my fight. I get prize money, so I'll look after the the other fighters. I'll, I'll shout them dinner. I'll pay for things. I'll buy the treats. I'll get the the drinks after our training. And then when someone else has their fight, that means their their bank balance is raised up. So then they'll start paying for everything. Okay, so, so we sort of, a- we sort of look, we, we have each other's back. Mm. So even though um, we're like a little family, so today you have money, we, I take care of you. Tomorrow I have money, so I take care of everyone. So um, yeah, you learn to have that community bond with uh, not just the 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 camp, but yeah, you yeah yeah you're running together, you're training together, you're sleeping together. 
Uh, and then, yeah, when times are good, we're all celebrating together. And when times are bad, we're all sad together. <laughs> Wayne and Mike, I want to ask you guys both, you know, um, once UFC began, it became clear that the, maybe the most competent striking art in real world scenarios is Muay Thai. Before that, nobody knew, actually. So initially, there were different strike arts. I wanted to ask you guys, what is it about Muay Thai that makes it so effective as a striking art? I mean, the things that come to mind to me that are different is like elbows and knees and then the shin kicks, which I wanted to ask you about, Wayne. I wanted to ask you, do they really condition their shins on bamboos like in the movie with Van Damme? Is it really like that? And why do they use their shins? So the, the, it used, the unusual things about Muay Thai, the clinch, it also looks very unusual to me. What is it about these things that makes Muay Thai superior? And is it superior? Like to Dutch yeah. kickboxing or... Uh, with the tie boxing, so the the first thing I noticed was the the the, the bags. The bags are made like almost like concrete. Um, you, you kick them in, in Western culture. They're they're full of rags, and then uh, in in Thailand, it's all sawdust. And then you can imagine uh, every every day, everyone's sweating. So the the sawdust is getting wet, and then the the sawdust is forming into like a con a concrete almost material. So uh, and then the, the the bag would have like a an, an arch in it from all the conditioning or the indentation of where the kicks are landing, and then if you don't land in the exact same spot and you get the corner of the bag, it feels like you're broken your leg. So you might be do 20, 25 rounds on the heavy bag at a, a session, morning and night, um, and kicking as hard as possible, um, and just getting that, that that shin conditioning. So your your shins like baseball bats. Um, so now I'm at the stage where uh, my, my shins are callous, where I can go five rounds with a tie and have zero pain. And um, when I first started out, if I after a, a, couple, a couple of shin blocks or a shin kicks, um, yeah, I'll, I'll hobble down the street. But now my my, my shins are so strong. But but wait, can you um, tell it, our audience, just, like people like me who have never done a shin kick before? I've I've only kicked people with my foot. What is it? Why is it different? Why is it better? How does it feel when you first get started? I mean, doesn't it shorten your range? What's good about it? Uh, using your shins, uh, yeah, like I said before, it's like a baseball bat. Because so the, the, there's, the, there's too many, uh, too many bones in, in your feet. So if you kick an elbow or, or a knee, um, mm. you're hobbling around the ring and you can barely stand. You have no footwork. Whereas uh, the shins just look like that one big baton. Um, so uh, I have, I've had X-rays on my shins as well, where I have minimal bone marrow. So the the shins are so callous and, and uh, so much calcium build up that uh, that that's almost like a pure bone. Uh, wow, are you serious? He, 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 he showed me my x-ray and he goes, oh, look at that. This is fascinating. I, I'd love to take your x-ray to a, a university to show you different um, uh, professors that you can change your own bone structure with years and years of training, how you can condition the, your own body like Wolverine. Fascinating. Um, so, yeah, it is just crazy. Um, when my, my doctor was explaining it to me, it's like, oh, wow. This, am I, I asked him, am I going to have problems later on when I get older? <laughs> no, in fact, it's the opposite. You're going to have super strong bones where you, you shouldn't have uh, osteoarthritis or anything like that. You should be you should be strong. You should be fine. Um, do the elbows yeah, so and like, knees get like, conditioned too? Do they, do, or is uh, it just uh, just learning how to use them? It's not so much. Uh, so my my shins, forearms, and and knuckles all have a uh, extra extra uh, calcium build up on them, so they're all nice and strong um, from all the X-rays that I've had over the years. Uh, yeah, it's just it's just all the trauma. Your body adjusts to uh, to the conditions that you're living under. I, I guess the body's an amazing thing that learns how to adapt. Now, no, how do you guys train the clinch? Why is the clinch so unusual in Muay Thai? It, it looks different. I don't know anything about fighting, but it looks different when they do the clinch than other people. It seems the most advanced clinch other than wrestling, I guess. Or am I wrong? It's, it's so hard. It's so hard it's because the, uh, when the ties, uh, they, they, they grab it. And, and it's the number one scoring um, system on, in the tie boxing. So so punches barely score. Uh, uh, kicks and elbows are the next highest. And then in the, in the clinch, because it's so hard, to, to land effective knees is, is the highest scoring um, uh, weapon out of, out of all the different techniques. Mm -hmm. So uh, to, be, to be effective in the clinch and to say you can throw somebody down um, that's one of the highest scorers as well. So to have good balance, um, good posture. And then, and then the more you train, um, when you first start out, you look at your opponent's feet and you're trying to get the timing. And then the more and more you train, you, you start to feel the person's energy, like a keto, where if they get a knee right, you push them to the left. So they're, they're losing, you, you're using their momentum against them. So um, years and years and years of uh, everyday practice and to get the, so um, I can definitely swear without a word of a lie that the clinch is the hardest thing out of everything for sure. 
Um, the tires used to just throw me dead to the ground every 15, 20 seconds, stand over the top of me, wait for me to stand up, grab me by the neck again, land a few knees, throw me to the floor again. And um, I didn't know they then, could throw people on the floor. That's allowed? You can just, it's oh, yeah, like, you sure. know, you can throw people? It's it's the number one scoring technique in, in Thailand. You can, be, you can be winning the four rounds, fall over two or three times in the last round and lose. So it's definitely, yeah, it's so crazy. It so sucks. Um, you just watch the scoring. You're winning here and all of a sudden the scoring will just change all because uh, you, you fell down a couple of times. It's, it, it's uh, very heartbreaking, especially if you're the guy that does the throw. You stand there and, you, and then if you're the guy picking yourself off the floor, it zaps whatever energy that you have remaining in, in, in your tank. So it's uh, not only are you losing, but now you're, you're absolutely gassed from picking yourself up. So... Um, the other, the other yeah, thing that's and, and you, you can imagine, you can imagine the the energy that you're using. You're both standing, you're both wrestling, uh, you're both scoring knees, um, you're both trying to resist uh, gravity, <laughs> and then uh, yeah, and then when the referee says stop, stand back, and you just feel your soul leave your body as your body starts breaking, and then you got to go straight in, and you got to try and pretend that you're fine, but deep down inside you're thinking, oh no, I'm absolutely gassed. I've got nothing left. So um, yeah, it's so it's so tough. It's so hard, uh, and it's, and the ties know how to use the, the the tip of their knee too. So if you score a, a good knee on your ribs, it just feels like you're the knee into your soul. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta be honest with you. After I watched the last week, we had Rich Franklin on the show, and I watched the Anderson Silva Rich Franklin <laughs> fight, which was just knees uh, in a row, like so many knees. I hate knees now. I'm like scared to death of knees after just watching yeah. that. I've been kneed once when I was a kid. It went really badly for me, and I didn't know how yeah. to knee back. <laughs> so I hate knees. And then I saw that fight. I'm like, this is knee abuse. This is horrible. Yeah. So, but, but, I, but you know, the other thing about Muay Thai is the I think the leg kicks were started from Muay Thai, right? They came into UFC from Muay Thai. Because yes. the other karate yeah. and taekwondo, they don't really do leg kicks so much, right? Uh, so so um, when, when, you, when you really... Uh, uh, when you really have a good bond with your opponent and you, you land a good strike, you say, I need you. I need you. And then they knee you back and say, I need you too. <laughs> <laughs> we, we need each other. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. So with the ties, um, when they, when the ties first started fighting Westerners, uh, not many Westerners knew how to, how to block or use, use, use their checks. Um, so that was quite devastating. And then, um, once Westerners started uh, adapting to the Thai style more, um, they started getting their blocks up. So then the Thais had to change their game into more of a, a clinching um, because of the, it takes so long and it's so uh, intricate, the little details that have an effective clinch. Um, so so once the Thais couldn't start winning with their leg kicks anymore, then yeah, then they adapt to plan B, which was the clinch. Then, and then, um, then they just dominate from there. But now, over the years, the Western is getting stronger in all aspects of the, the sport and with the clinch, with the striking, with the, 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 the defense, um, using their blocks, um, keeping it at range. Uh, so when I first got to Thailand in, in the 90s, uh, no camps won the Westerners. Uh, you, you go to the uh, it would all be ties and the, the camp it's like the movies you'd knock on the, the gate and no 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 westerners even the camp that I was at they didn't want me to train there either we don't want westerners because if we teach you guys then you guys are going to start beating us at our own sport uh -huh. it's like stop it and uh -huh. then sure enough uh, fast forward 20 years later and all of a sudden the westerners are going over and smashing the ties and, and um, <laughs> their, their, their worst fear came true to, to lose they were right um, and back in the early, say, let's say the 80s and the 90s, uh, if a Thai traveled overseas and, and lost to a Westerner, they weren't allowed to come home because they've... Uh, That's that honor thing. Yeah, they've, they've discredited the sport. They've discredited the country. They've wow. uh, humiliated the king. Wow. Uh, there's so many different aspects where it's like you can't show your face back home again. You have, you have to try and... Um, a lot of the West uh, Thais would disappear if they were brought in Australia. That Before they caught the plane, they'd, they'd, they'd vanish, they'd run away. And that's why it's so hard for um, ties to travel to get visas because uh, it's known as the Robin Hood. Uh, <laughs> they'd, go, they'd go to somewhere and then just disappear and not come back again and start a new <laughs> lifestyle overseas. Yeah, it's... Um, wow, it's incredible. Uh, They're almost like Japanese in terms of the like uh, honor and uh, shame issues. Oh, and like it, right? Big wow. time, big time. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's so... It's so crazy. But now it, it seems like uh, everyone's adapted and uh, the, a lot more aware that the Westerners are catching up. But, but uh, back in the older days, it was, um, yeah, you were a disgrace. Yeah, I, I had one fight on the King's birthday 
2000, uh, no, 1999. Um, I broke this tie's forearm and I broke his nose and I, I beat him quite convincingly every single round. And then the, the poor guy, the fight's finished, he's walking back to his change room and the ties is just yelling abuse at him. How, you're a loser, you're a nobody, you're a piece of crap, you're this and that. All because even though he's got a broken arm and he never gave up and fought the five rounds and went the four distance, um, ties are just so brutal that because uh, it was it was on the king's birthday, yeah. uh, so so um, the last thing you want to do is lose on that show because not only you're fighting for your country but for the king, and to lose in front of the uh, well, not, uh, the king's not there, of course, but um, oh, I thought the, the king the, was there the, on the king's uh, king's oh, birthday. No, he, oh, he's he's the king. He doesn't oh. have to do anything. He, okay. he he's the king. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, so. So he might do a, a, a ticket tech parade. He drives down the street in the car and everyone's on the side of the street and everyone's got their flags and everyone's just to, just to see a, a glimpse of the king driving past in the car is like the ultimate good luck. Um, yeah. Just the, um, and then I'm not sure if you know much about Thailand, but if you go to the movies before every movie starts, uh, they'll, they'll do the commercials. And then before the movie starts, uh, the king's anthem will come on the, the big screen. Everyone has to stand up. Um, pay their respects then the song finishes everyone sits down so so to see the king drive past in the car um, it's just massive and then uh, and then um, we get a hundred thousand people in a park so ah this is funny so you know the the movie Kickboxer the Van Damme mm-hmm. at the very start uh, they're holding pads for each other and then Dennis Alexio is kicking and I don't know uh, he, Dennis is holding for Van Damme and Van Damme's going bah, 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 and he pushes in what are you doing none of that tip tap shit um, that was the park that we got the fight at. I got the fight there uh, four different occasions uh, wow. from the from the, the the same park as the movie. Um, so a hundred thousand people come to this park, and then the fireworks go off to celebrate the king, and then all these different festivities start. Where the ring will be in the middle, and on the side it might be dancing over here, it might be a, a puppet show over here, it might be some other form of entertainment, and and it's just a. It's a to as a community share share the celebration of uh, not only the country but for the king is such a, a massive honor so to do that four times was so so amazing but to see the the ties react the way they react if the ties lose it was uh um, i wanted to ask you about that i wanted to ask you what it was like to win as a foreigner on the king's birthday three times i wondered if they're yeah, cheering amazing. you on or are they upset because it's a national you know it's kind of like i know they accept you as like an honorary tie sort of but but still yeah. i was just curious So they were harsh oh, on the guy losing, huh? Oh, yeah. If you're, if you're the tie and you lose, it's so bad. It's so rough. But uh, I, I was very lucky. Um, like I mentioned before, I can speak Thai now. Uh, I, I used to fight on Thai TV and making the front cover. So I, I became recognizable to a lot of people in the sport. Um, so when I uh, – I remember I won in 1999. Um, they, they don't usually have an MC or someone. So they had the, the TV commentary right at the side of the ring. And I leapt through the ropes. I said, give me a microphone. Mm. And they're like, what? I said, give me a microphone. Give me a microphone. So they, they quite uh, sheepishly handed up the mic. And then in Thai, to 100,000 people live on Thai TV, I'm like, so why do you talk on? Which means, oh, hello, everybody in the Thailand. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, it's such an honor to win on today's celebration. And this is all in Thai. Um, long live the king from Australia and just having 100,000 people applaud it was uh, so so amazing and then um, the next couple of times after I fought on the king's birthday for that uh, uh, we do a little dance but before the fight starts to uh, ask permission from the gods to give us you know, strength and protection and then um, the, the ties would cheer for me louder than my Thai opponent So to be accepted as uh, as one of them it was just like the, the ultimate uh, is, th- is this after you thank you, you. Is this after you introduced the gunslinger aspect to the dance? When had you done uh, that? Which year was that? Uh, the, the the gun started in 97. My okay. first fight at Lumpini, at, L- at Lumpini Stadium. I was the, the very first Australian to ever fight there. So, so, that, so that's, how, that's how Wayne stopped being the dangerous kangaroo. Because you oh, were originally no, no, before, the dangerous kangaroo. Before, 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 before. Oh, so, it was so already... Rewind. <laughs> so, so 1996, I got the opportunity to have my first fight for the, the Bangkok camp. Uh, and then they said, everyone has a fight name. Um, what are we going to call you? Uh, and then in Wayne translated in Thai means bastard. So we can't call you a bastard. We can't call you a bastard. In front of everyone. We, we need to give you a fight name. Um, so so the, the superstar at the camp that I was training at, his name was um, Saint Noi. Mm. It means the small candlelight flame. Um, and then you got other guys that are called Sanchai. Uh, sorry. Uh, there's a guy called um, San Liam. 
uh, which means 100,000 techniques. So every single person has a, a name that represents something. Yeah. So, and they said, oh, so what, what are we going to call you? What should we do? What, what's your history? And I said, oh, I, I grew up on farms with horses. So you're like a cowboy. So what about we call you John Wayne? Going, oh, no, that sucks. That's the worst name ever. I don't want to be called John Wayne. <laughs> no, no, no. You, 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 don't, don't worry. It's, it brings good karma because everyone knows who John Wayne is. It'll be easy for people to remember your name in. Ah, ah. Okay, I'm thinking to myself, all right, I'll use it while I'm in Thailand. And then when I get back to Australia, I'll go back to being like the executioner or the killer or the or something or something Western. And then, um, yeah, then I started getting famous in Thailand. And all of a sudden, everyone's like, John Wayne, John Wayne. It's like, oh, no, yeah, I'm stuck with this bloody stupid name. <laughs> I thought John was your first name, by the way. I, I had no idea until recently. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so and then and then when you tell people John Wayne, everyone has a bit of a giggle. But then remember, everyone remembers. So it, the ties had a good, uh, very good point of what they came up with. So and then the good karma comes. So um, yeah, I'm so so lucky. And then um, so 1997, um, so 96, I won first five fights, and then 94, I won my next four fights. So I won my first nine fight straights in Thailand. Um, started making the, I made the, the front cover of the, the national magazine, the, the, mm. the first Western ever to make the front cover. So uh, when it came out, I took the, the cover to the camp and I got them to read in Thai. And I said, oh, it says here that you're, you're the dangerous kangaroo. Oh, that was after. <laughs> <What the, laughs> yes. Yeah, so I, I didn't even know. I didn't even know. I've learned this for the first time as well. So, it's like, oh, and, so now, now I'm a cowboy. I'm a kangaroo. It's like, oh, whatever, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Before, before we leave uh, Muay Thai techniques, the last thing I want to ask you about is recently we've been talking about what they call oblique kicks. Are these used a lot in Muay Thai, the kicks that can like uh, turn the knee upside down sort of? Is that still used a lot? And do, do people uh, blow out their knees often? Uh, no. Uh, the, the ties, the shins are so conditioned. Um, I, I think you, you, you're talking about the calf kicks in, in the MMA. In that MMA, they call, an, right oh, they call it an oblique kick, but it's actually kicking the front of the knee, the, the lead oh, knee. okay. Uh, what's okay. it called? I think, I think they're kicking, I think they're kicking more of the calf. It's oh. more of a, it's, yeah, the calf kick. So it's oh. just a, maybe inch or so under the knee. Oh. Um, and, and they're just, uh, uh, yeah. It flips the, the, the leg back yeah. the wrong way? It takes takes out the calf muscle so you can't apply any pressure to the leg whatsoever. It just gives out. Um, but the ties are so good at checking that you turn your foot on a 45 angle so it's bone on bone instead of bone on muscle. Um, oh. So it's very dangerous to, to keep. The, the shin because it ends up hurting. If you're the kicker, it hurts him more than the guy getting kicked. So, so it's because of their stance. Try and, yeah, because of their stance. And because they're so used to being kicked, they're, they're so light on their toes, that their, their, their checks come up rather fast. Um, in, in MMA, a lot of guys will have their body weight more front foot orientated, whereas toe boxing, all their body weight's on their back foot so they can bring their lead leg up nice and fast to, to, to do their blocking. So... Um, I see yeah, that, different yeah. stances, different different stances, different conditioning. Um, because we train our shins to kick the heavy bags and the heavy, the hard pads, um, and all the fights. Like I was saying before, that we have different calcium build up on our shins. So when it's shin on shin, um, yeah, there's zero pain. But uh, if I did if I didn't check it though, I definitely have uh, dramas competing for the five round duration. If I took too much punishment. So, um, checking it, you mean with yeah. your shin, like lifting your leg up a yeah, bit so your shin deflects, yeah, so right? Yeah, you, you, you turn your foot on a 45 degree angle. So, when it, it's just bone on bone, mm. and it, it's very, uh, got it, caveman orientated where it's who's tough, who wins. So, <laughs> the last thing, yeah, there's, there's not much, um, technique behind it. It's, and then in Thailand, too, um, at, at Lumpini, whoever steps back, uh, uh, loses points. They want you to walk oh. forward the whole time. So you've got two wow. guys that will just stand in front of each other and just trade. And the first one to give up, start stepping backwards, is almost like um, surrendering, which uh, which will, will change the outcome of the betting as well. So, yeah. Wow. So, the, so, so forward, the, take so punishment, the, counter, take punishment, counter. So the betting and the scoring really determine how these matches go. Otherwise, they would go very differently. The people, I mean, people yeah. w would be, you know, like, for example, you're saying that if you, if you step, take a step back, you lose points. So you can't like dance around the ring and get away from the guy. You've got to keep pressing on, right? Yeah, it's very, yeah. it's very. Um, it, it changes the whole strategy. So, so Lumpini's, uh, they, 
back in well, well, what the Thais told me anyway was uh, Lumpini was very forward based whoever's walking forward um, has the the upper hand sort of thing and then at Rajanam Dern the other stadium in Bangkok um, they're more about the technique more about uh, um, looking classy and, and trying to out, outsmart your opponent whereas the, the Lumpini is more forward based style so, so, so different stadiums have different sort of uh, scoring almost uh, so yeah, but it's, at the end of the day, uh, it's very it's very frowned upon to to to, to move around and be like a westerner. It's all about uh, <laughs> st- staying tight, staying strong, staying in the pocket, and just uh, relying on your defenses to get you out of trouble instead of running away. So it's better to take a block and come straight back to score instead of to 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 run. Otherwise, you look weak. When what do the ties think about John- Mui Lao? Oh, sorry, Mike, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, no problem. I, I just wanted to see, John, if, if you can. And what name do you prefer, by the way? Yeah, I'm calling him topic? Wayne, what, but what, I don't know if I should call you John Wayne or just. <laughs> uh, just, just Wayne's good. Either or Wayne, John Wayne. Uh, maybe Wayne. John. Right, yeah. Champ. How about Champ? We call you Champ. Ten times. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, that's easy. We'll do that. Um, can you explain to those watching right now, a little bit new from Leo's audience to combat, the difference between the Dutch style and the Thai style? Right, because a lot of people, they, they, they confuse the two. Yeah. And if you could explain, because there are very unique differences between those two different styles. And then we have Western boxing, which is a completely different sport all, all together. Yeah, so with the, the Thai scoring system, um, they believe punching punching's easy. Um, so it's not a very big scoring uh, a weapon. Uh, and it, leg kicks are very effective, but at the same time, uh, it's quite easy to throw a leg kick also. So for the Thai scoring, they, they want everything above the waist. So kicking above the waist, um, landing the knees above the waist. Um, so if you if you throw six punches and throw one body kick, the body kick will win. Uh, and then with the the Dutch style, um, with the likes of Raymond Deckers, Rob Carmen, and and, and um, the Dutch influence, um, they were using a lot of their boxing um, mm. to help knock out the ties. They might not score, but at the same time, if they land that big shot and win by knockout, it's, it's still a win. So um, the the Dutch style is very Boxing influence with leg kicks uh, in Thailand, it, it's it's frowned upon because it doesn't it, it it hurts but doesn't score. So you have two conflicting styles. And back in the old days, the the ties were so amazing that the the, the it was very west very difficult for a western to win. But then the, when the Dutch uh, implemented their system with the more boxing, um, all of a sudden the ties didn't know how to take the pressure. And then once that was started becoming successful, and then you had these two contrasting styles that were. Uh, Sometimes it'd be good for the Thai. Sometimes it'd be good for the Dutch. So, and then, um, yeah. And then if you can mold them both together and have the best of both worlds, then you're in, in a good place. But yeah, so yeah, to me, fighting's fighting. The, the Dutch Thai at the end of the day, it's all the same. Long as long as you're hurting people, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. But sure. Is there a is there a French by the way kickboxing also that was pop? I mean, oh. what's kick? Yes, in the in the nineties. Um, so the Dutch. So Thailand was number one, and then uh, Holland and France were the second two best countries after that. Um, they had the megastars, the the Danny Bulls, the Murad Saris, the Stefan Nakinas, um, and Holland had the Raymond Deckers, the Rob Carmens. Uh, yeah, it was uh, Peter Schmidt. Um, there were so many influential fighters from from Europe that were going to Thailand regularly and beating the Thai. It's like, oh, these are the, these guys are amazing. Um, yeah, what? and then uh, so you're you're saying that basically a lot of the high kicks then are there because of the scoring of the fights, and so you may yes. that's why you may see less uh, head shin kicks in the UFC, for example, because it can be caught and it's not awarded the same way. Maybe is that what you're saying also? Oh, uh, MMA and Muay Thai are completely different. So, completely, yeah, yeah it's, it's a com- you have completely yeah. different rules, right? But what I mean to oh, say yeah. is that high kicks, like generally high kicks, you, when grappling is allowed, you see less high kicks. Is that right or wrong? Because uh, cause it, it can just, be caught it, it, or... It, it, in Thai boxing, it takes more skill to land a kick uh, on the bicep uh, than it is to land a leg kick. So leg kick, leg, even though a leg kick is very effective, um, it's quite easy to just to throw a lazy, lazy leg kick whereas it, it takes skill to um to land an effective body kick so mm-hmm. i think the ties uh that they, they respect someone that can, has a higher standard than the, mm-hmm. the someone that can just throw a, a, an easy leg kick that um, mm-hmm. doesn't take much the skill so yeah it's, it's very uh 
And in MMA, the high kick is more dangerous for the aggressor because it then puts them on one leg, which yeah. makes it uh. easier for the wrestler, let's say, to close the distance. Or you throw a high kick, you're slightly off balance, you can fall on your back, uh. you've given up a takedown. So the time so it's not so much I mean, about you, you grabbing the leg. It's just about you're on one leg, so I could take you down or something like that. I got yeah. it. Okay. Rarely do you see a high kick get caught because to catch a high kick, you're probably going to get blasted in the head. Yeah, that's true. That's catch true. a baseball bat being swung at your skull. <laughs> but if someone's <laughs> going to swing a baseball bat and you rush, just no technique, run into them, you can knock them down pretty quick. So, you know, I, I trained with Team Quest for years. They would love the high kick. Because that means their opponent's on one leg. That's the easiest takedown there is, right? You got to get two legs off the floor. One's already off the floor for you. Boom, give a little forward pressure. They're on their heel. They're on their back. So that's – but then there was – and, you know, John alluded to this earlier. There's a constant evolution where whatever skill set comes new and gets refined and worked on, then everyone in the world figures it out, comes out with a counter to it. And again, the evolution continues, right? The, mm. the Thai fighters come in, then the wrestlers ebb and back, and then the jujitsu fighters figure out how to take out the wrestlers. But then the stand-up experts are able to scramble back up to their feet and maybe close the distance. So there's this constant ebb and flow, but just to, to point that on the head you kick. Know what? And you think about head kick, you look at John Jones. John Jones knocked out Daniel Cormier, one of the greatest wrestlers of all times, with a well-timed head kick. Yeah. So it's more dangerous, but when you have two very, very highly skilled uh, you know, opponents, it's, it's a thing of beauty. You're describing something interesting, by the way, Mike. You know, in uh, in economics, we have the same principle, which is when you develop a theory to to explain a financial market, the theory then gets used by the people in the financial market. Then the market changes to reflect the theory. Then your theory doesn't apply anymore to describe it. So it's constantly evolving. It's the same in fighting, I guess, right? But I want to ask you, Wayne, about about Mui Lao. Mui Lao is uh, becoming more popular around the world. When you went to Thailand in the 90s, did you hear about Mui Lao? Um, what do Thai people think about it? Uh, I, I, we're talking about the, the bare knuckle? Yeah, we're talking about it exactly. It's like Muay Thai, but they do headbutts. And and I don't yes. know if you've heard about it before. I don't know much about it Ooh. myself. Uh, yeah, so uh, the prize money was only like $50 to fight a, a gentleman with, with bare, the, 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 uh, oh, <laughs> pl- plaster their hands up. So their, their wrist was locked in nice and strong. They'd put all the tape across their knuckles. So it would become like, mm. a, a, like a weapon. And then no glove. And then uh, their faces all distorted, and their bodies all messed up, and they're getting knocked out cold. And at the end of the fight, uh, here's your fifty dollars. That's like, oh yeah, screw that um, longevity. There's no longevity in the bare knuckle market, so uh, I'm back then anyway. And then to to see the tie boxes on TV and fighting in stadiums and getting all these, uh, uh, let's say if you have a big fight, you might win a car or you might win a gold chain or you might win something uh, super cool. Yeah. So uh, there, there was there was a lot more opportunity to become a superstar in Muay Thai than it was uh, fighting the, the bare knuckle uh, circuit. Yeah. Um, how, top, how, top. Co- I just, let me jump in briefly. How common, John, was doctoring of the gloves or the wraps? We know Antonio Margarito very infamously was busted with plaster of Paris right yes. on his gauze, where you turn the gauze literally into cement. Fast. I would imagine you know, that it was rather common depending on how the, the Thai market was with the heavy betting. This is just an assumption here. Mm. Do you have any experience in knowing it or seeing it? I mean, this oh. You're talking about a deadly combination here. And I, I remember guys in the early days of MMA, real story up in Medford, mm. Oregon, guys were wrapping their hands with duct tape. Wow. You yep. put enough, John knows, you put enough duct tape in, into the gauze and then put that into an MMA glove Man, you have hands of steel. Yeah. This was when regulation, this is just going back 15 years. Wow. I, I got to think that there are some that maybe, maybe, you know, John Wayne Parr around the world a million times. Yeah. Have, have you seen any stories like that? Oh, every, 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 in the 90s, that's how you wrap your hands. Um, so you'd, you'd, you'd take some um, tape and then you'd, you'd roll the tape into uh, nice and thin and then you place it around the knuckles. You might put uh, a dozen rolled up. Um, pieces of tape across your knuckles and make it super tight then put tape across the top and then or, or like you were saying it was like plaster casts where, where it was yeah. um, you get, you'd be almost hear it ding 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 <laughs> and then uh, in the stadiums we used to fight in six ounce gloves as well so they were almost like MMA gloves except for the normal gloves but at the same time there, there was no padding in them whatsoever and then with the stadium gloves imagine they're getting used every day so they're always wet and always uh, 
um, almost warm. You put your hand in the sticky, wet glove that someone else has just taken off. And uh, then you got plaster of Paris on your hands as well. So um, people enjoy knockouts. So I guess that was part of the reason why uh, the ties got entertained so much because they knew uh, people were, were going to... But the, the ties barely punched, even though they had all this uh, plaster on their hands and all this uh, tape over their knuckles. They, all, they were lying on their kicks to score. So And then because uh, I came from Western country and I was a lot more uh, boxing influenced, so I was knocking out the ties with my hands because the ties... Um, one of the score, they wanted to win by points, and, and um, so that, that's how I was lucky to to be so successful to, to rely yeah. on, on take advantage of those knuckle busters, uh, yeah. to, to do the damage. Knuckle busters is great, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> When Mike and I have been asking people about this because we had also, uh, before we had somebody on who, who fight, fought in bare knuckle competitions before, and we wanted, you just said that there's no longevity when you go to bare knuckle, or it used to be at least, maybe when they used to wrap the, the wrist like that. They still do, by the way, apparently. In the bare knuckle boxing championships, they seem to wrap the wrist very well, so it doesn't break. So then you have this like hard surface that hits your face. But the thing is, Joe Rogan has been talking about this on his show also. And Joe was saying that maybe bare knuckle may be less damaging because you can hit with less pressure on the head than you could if you had big gloves. So maybe the shaking of the brain is less significant. But that's not really true if you have the wrist wrapped, right? What do you think about uh, that? Yeah, Which one is less damaging for the brain long term, would you think? I think wearing gloves definitely is a lot more better. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, so, so you want to uh, uh, wrap your wrist so your wrist doesn't move. So if you punch wrong, there's no, there's no turning. So mm-hmm. it's just like a, uh, like a hammer. So mm-hmm. when it hits, it hits strong. Um, and then good protection over the knuckles so that you're not breaking your hands as you, as you hit. Um, even with gloves on, I've broken my hands so many times. Uh, really? And that's with 10 So I, I couldn't imagine the idea of punching someone bare knuckle on, on the skull. Um, uh, my, my fingers cringe every time I think of that pro- prospect of uh having to having to hit someone without a glove on oh. um yeah I, i've been very lucky to have 148 fights and and uh okay-ish um wow. lots of injections and everything else but uh <laughs> the idea of fighting uh, no gloves whatsoever is just uh that's so cringy when brother you, you broke your fight in a in you broke your hands in a fight with big gloves on uh, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you, the metacarpals will bang into each other, uh, having bone edema. And um, break, so yeah. the, the bone, the bone marrow will swell inside the metacarpals, and then you can barely move your hand. And even though it's not broken, um, it's the the same pain as a broken hand, and it takes you it takes you um, months to learn how to close your hand again and to get uh, be able to hit the pads or anything like that. It's a uh, yeah, so painful. So when yeah, the so night. In the 90s, during this time, we're talking about these interesting gloves, which sound like knuckle dusters or whatever those things are called. Yeah. It sounds more like that. But in those in the 90s, then was uh, were they testing in Thailand for PEDs? Was PEDs a thing? Were fighters using PEDs back then? Not so much. Oh no. So so uh, when we used to go and train, so every afternoon, uh, uh, our, our form of uh, our pre workout was going to the chemist and we're going to have some ginseng tablets. So it ginseng. was like five, five, five baht for a ginseng. And, and it wasn't it. Or, or you might get the little um, old school uh, M150, uh, like an energy drink, or there was no Red Bulls or Monster Cans or anything back then. Um, so the, the idea of uh, steroids or uh, testosterone or anything of like those sort of things was just. Uh, zero um okay yeah it's a different different era um yeah I, I didn't even didn't even uh enter my mind and then i believed in myself so much that even if you were on steroids hopefully uh uh it'll affect your cardio so i knew that you might be strong enough at the same time i knew that I, if i could survive the first couple of rounds that i'd eventually win uh, with my uh my work rate i i'd, I'd, I'd bury you in pressure so, yeah, I, I didn't care if you were on steroids or not because um, you know, I knew that I, I, I'd be more clear um, instead of running off aggression. 
You know what's interesting about this is that this channel has a lot of bodybuilding uh, uh, or bodybuilders that follow the channel, and a lot of them actually live in Thailand. I don't know if you know this, but there's like a bodybuilding subculture in Thailand. I don't know if it existed in the late 90s, but a lot of people move there from Europe because steroids are somewhat less controlled there, so they get to live their life and have a good time in Pattaya and get steroids and so on. So it's interesting to, to note that they didn't use much of it in Thai boxing back then. But, you know, I wanted to ask you about something because you were preparing uh, George Sim Pierre for his fight against Johnny Hendricks and I, I heard in one of your interviews that you were uh, present at some of the discussions about drug testing back then about for that fight specifically I wanted to ask you maybe if you could describe to us like what was um, what was the contention at the time because this is a very m monumental time I think for the UFC because I think from what I gather from your interviews that you see it as sort of being that George St. Pierre when he pulled out of the UFC after it which he did to some degree because because of the lack of clarity and performance enhancing drug use that it made the UFC then join USADA. So it was a very yes, important yes. event. What happened in, yes. in those discussions? Uh, so, yeah, this is uh, crazy. So I remember, uh, uh, so they, back in the old days, uh, they used to do the P test, I think before the fight and after the fight, but for the, the 10 week lead up, there, there was no testing, but only test on that day. Uh -huh. And then um, George was very concerned finding someone as strong as Johnny Hendricks, it wasn't natural that he had so much uh, power, so much strength. So um, George George came to the conclusion of, well, if UFC isn't going to take the road to, to, to do uh, in-house testing, um, I'm willing to pay for both of us to get tested um, in, in uh, randomly in, in the next 10 weeks, um, maybe multiple times. So there was no, um, t uh, is it tapering off the course or whatever yeah. they do? Yeah. Um, cycling. Um, cycling. Yeah. So, so, um, so George said, I'm willing to, uh, uh, sp spend my own money on for both of us. And if Johnny Henry accepts, that means that he's has, has a clear conscience. And so, um, the next day, Dana White, uh, criticized George St. Pierre saying, I can't believe that you're taking these steps. Uh, you obviously don't believe in our, our, uh, system. Um, you think you're better than, than the company to go out on your own and do this by yourself. And just ridicule George. And George was so angry and so mad and so was Faraz. He's going, I can't believe that Dana White went out of his way to we're, – we're trying to lift the sport up and make it an even playing field and, and then we're then getting criticised for it. Um, I think George was so heartbroken that um, that he was trying to do something positive for the sport and to, to, to be to – be, um, yeah, criticized for it. It was heartbreaking. So after the Hendricks fight, when he called retirement, I think that was his, that was his way of making a stand, of saying, "All right, you you want to make fun of me and you want to uh, uh, ridicule my name, or well, I'll well, fuck you. I'll show you that I'm I'm done." Then, so yeah, it was, it was quite a bizarre um, situation to be sitting present at the table and to, to hear George like generally concerned for his own safety that he's going to fight someone that's um, chemically enhanced. Uh, and all he wanted to do was make it even, and then to 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 for what happened to him, he's just like, all right, obviously you guys don't respect my my own health, so uh, as a as a way to show you, I'm 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 gonna step away from the sport for a while until you get you guys get your stuff together. And then since then, everything changed. Uh, Asada came in, and they, they cleaned up all the sport, and everyone started popping left, right, and center. And it, it was a bizarre time back then too, with everyone on TRT. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a, it was really weird. It was a strange times where Vitor, uh, yeah, Vitor, yeah, and, uh, <laughs> oh jeez. Uh, well, by the way, by the way, on this topic, <laughs> Vitor, Vitor just fought, just fought this weekend. I think it was TRT Vitor, but we didn't see his size come back because they told him that the fight would be at a lower weight uh, class. I don't know if you noticed oh, that, Mike. Okay. He didn't have all his muscle back. But anyway, sorry to interrupt. You're gonna say something, Mike? I did notice. Yeah, can I just add some context? Because I was working with Johnny Hendricks for the GSP fight. I was working oh, with Johnny Hendricks geez. for multiple fights before that. So, so, no, it's okay, John, we could give context here. And I think that Johnny and George were pawns being politicized, right? Because I was behind the scenes also. Johnny wanted drug testing. Johnny was a two-time NCAA Division I national champion. Johnny had taken hundreds of drug tests throughout his career to get to the D1 level, to compete at the D1 level, to be a two-time national champion, Johnny Hendricks was tested a hell of a lot. He won two Division I national champions drug-free. 
tested more times than than he's ever been tested in the UFC and, and George has ever been tested in the UFC. I got to I got to put that out there to be fair because Johnny Hendricks I believe was unduly criticized for reasons that were not factual, they were more emotional. George saw how powerful Johnny was and for some reason George was boot because George or in my opinion knew Johnny Hendricks was a better wrestler. And he knew Johnny Hendricks had knockout power. Johnny Hendricks knocked out John Fitch. Johnny Hendricks beat up Josh Koscheck. Johnny Hendricks beat a lot of guys easier than George did during George's career. That's my opinion, to be fair. Now, part of the negotiations, George had a professional relationship with Vada. George wanted Vada Sorry, to Vada, yes. run the testing. Vada was a company that was partially owned and affiliated with Victor Conti, Victor Conti of Balco Labs, Victor Conti, who was, you know, convicted of steroid related crimes, whatever they were. Victor Conti wasn't someone that would be trustworthy. So Johnny felt and the whole Vada thing seemed off. But Vada had George St. Pierre on their header as one of their marketing tools, Johnny is and his team looked at that. They said, wait a minute, George wants his own company to be in charge of the drug testing. Well, that doesn't sound right. That's like Johnny saying, no, no, no. I want my, my sponsor to do all the drug testing. Johnny said, no, he wanted WADA testing, just like he had in his college career, just like they had in the Olympics. He said, bring in Olympic testing, bring in WADA. This is before USADA was a part of the USC, though the negotiations were going on. Johnny had always requested WADA testing, not VADA. George wanted VADA. And when it came time, to be fair, when it came time for George to agree to, to WADA, George and his team asked for the list of drugs that would be tested for. This is all public record. Mm -hmm. When that list came out, that's when George declined. So I think it would be very easy for Johnny to turn and point the finger at, at, at George and say, hey, George, which of the drugs on this list were you taking that you didn't want to get tested for? Because Johnny, Johnny agreed. He said, bring in water. I'm in. I don't have to see the list. I'm in. So that's a little bit more content. And I know, John, you didn't have a part. I didn't have a part in it. So this is like these two athletes were politicized in a big fight. Now, that being said, Johnny Hendricks is a clean athlete. Yeah. And I, I, I always, I always, we all know about TR TV tour, who I love. I'm friends with Vitor. We all know about Jail Sonnet, right? We all know about these athletes who, yeah, they, they, they dope, they got busted, they agreed to it. Man, to, to point at a kid like Johnny Hendricks, I mean, a two time Division I national champion, God, this kid's been tested his whole life. Mm -hmm. To make that association, I think is very disrespectful of George without any discernible proof, without any sort of fact. Johnny's never failed a drug test when the speculation has always been on George St. Pierre for having been one of the masters at doping and PEDs. George wow. even went on the Joe Rogan show and discussed how to beat the drug test. You just get on a plane, you go to another country where they can't test you. Yes. Right. I mean, George knew how to do it. And, and to be fair, George had the finances and even the travel schedule to have easily doped where a kid like Johnny Hendricks, who lived his whole life in, in Texas and Oklahoma, never basically left that, you know, 200 mile area. It'd be a hell of a lot harder. I'm not saying George did, but I'm just saying it's not fair to make that type of association to solely the, the lineage of an athlete for no reason other than he was powerful and he hit hard. My Fuck, vote, man. Yeah. What would you say to people then that um, that would say like Johnny Hendricks fought differently after uh, drug testing got in, in introduced and stuff like that? Johnny Hendricks fought differently after he won the world title. Johnny's goal was to win the world title and to go back and coach high school wrestling. Johnny's goal, actually, let me let me tell you the truth here. Johnny's goal wasn't even to win a world title. Johnny's goal was to be the number one fighter in the world, and that was George St. Pierre. Johnny's goal was to beat George St. Pierre. When Johnny fought George St. Pierre, Johnny was done. Now, I believe Johnny won that fight. 11 of the 12 media cage side said Johnny won that fight. It was a split decision. Probably the closest fight of George's career. If you watch that fight back again, you're probably going to say, well, shit, maybe Johnny won that fight. But hey, George walked away with the belt. You look at their faces afterwards. You look at George's body language, his head down, Johnny's hands up at the end of the fight. Man, 
Johnny did enough, I think, in, in my mind to say, hey, Johnny Hendricks, on that night, you were the greatest fighter in the world. Johnny moved on because he had a, a seven-figure payday in front of him to fight Robbie Lawler for the next fight, which he won that fight also. But Johnny was done, in my mind, after the George fight. He didn't want to fight anymore. He didn't even want to fight. But that was the way a college wrestler could make a couple extra dollars to buy a home for his family so he could go back. He just wanted to coach high school wrestling and work on his farm. Johnny Hendricks is a, a beautiful, simple American boy. Like, you know, and I'm saying that as a friend, I am a former coach. I'm biased. Although we stopped working together, we had a, a business fallout, to be fair. Johnny, let me share this briefly. I don't want to hijack the interview. But I left Johnny Hendricks's camp because he wasn't training the way a world-class athlete has to train. And I didn't want to put my time where it was not valued and respected. So I would rather work with an undercard athlete for no money and lose money than a world-class athlete that paid me a few percent of millions of dollars, which is a nice pay. I didn't want that. And that's, that's all clear also. But to, to answer the question, it had nothing to do with USADA. Johnny just didn't want to be there anymore. He didn't train to be there anymore. His coaches couldn't get him into the gym anymore. He was blowing up over 200 some odd pounds. He couldn't even make 185 anymore. And he had a beer belly or big belly, I should say. (laughs) It wasn't a USADA thing. The kid just didn't want to fight anymore. And he was a millionaire. Interesting. He was a a, a poor kid from, from, you know, Texas, Oklahoma, who won a couple million dollars and, you know, he just didn't want to be there anymore. That That's partially factual. And, and some of it's my own little personal opinion. Hmm. You know, when a fighter's done, they just don't want to be there anymore. You can't get them to show up to the gym. And when they do show up, man, they, they just, they don't even get through the warmups. Johnny should have retired after the GSP fight, in my opinion. That should have been it. This is something it seems that will never happen to Wayne, by the way, because he, he does not want to retire no matter what. Every interview I hear of him when he's about to retire, he's like, no, nah, I can still go. Actually, on that topic, well, well, but before we leave this, just briefly about PEDs and combat sports. So Wayne brought up something very interesting, which was he was saying GSP was worried about the physical force. Like if if you're in another sport like not a combat sport and using PEDs, you might win and sort of it's unfair because if somebody else is following the rules, they're not using the PEDs, they lost because you use PEDs, that's one thing. But in your in a combat sport where you can hurt each other, it's very interesting to me. It, it brings up the scale of the PED, like PEDs can actually harm the other person. So I wanted to ask you guys your opinion on this. I mean, obviously, PEDs should be controlled in combat sports because otherwise people will get hurt. But should there be a league where there is no testing? Because the reason I ask this is, is it wasn't it a little bit more entertaining back in the day when people were really powerful and they were not being mm-hmm. tested that much? I mean, I'm just pride, curious, baby. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Pr- pride, is pride not pride that tested. Days. Oh, yeah, pride is yeah, that's over. Yeah, uh, interesting. So, no, but so is Bellator test? Are all of them tested a lot like UFC? Right now, Ooh. and one. I don't think, I don't think there, there wasn't much testing when I was in Bellator. I was lucky to have uh, five fights at Bellator, and I, I never got tested wow. once. So oh. I'm not sure. Oh, okay, so this still goes on in other areas. Okay, <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. UFC is the gold standard. They have USADA oh. testing. It's the most stringent testing in the okay. world. But you know, there's a lot of other organizations that they do what the 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 state's most organizations simply defer to the state. And what John said earlier, the state will have you pee in a cup when you show up to fight night. Maybe they'll have you pee in a cup afterwards. And then maybe they'll test your pee. They'll probably pick maybe five of the bouts on a 10 bout card. And they'll probably test one or two of those, you know, those little jars of pee. And that's about it. Interesting. And what are they testing for? Yeah, exactly. But back on this topic of retirement. So, Wayne, tell us, are you actually retired or not? Because I know you, you tried uh, to retire in 2013, but then you, you yeah. love the sport too much. You love being a fighter. You came back. Then recently you had a hip injury, right? Uh, yes. Uh, so, at the happened? end of 2019, uh, my hip was at the stage where I couldn't wait there. I could barely walk. Um, mm. I ended up uh, having my last uh, boxing fight against a, a former world champion here in Australia called Anthony Mundine. Um, after the, the fight, um, I called retirement again because I just couldn't walk anymore. Um, had hip replacement. Oh, great. Uh, so, and then uh, I came back uh, 20 months after surgery uh, in April to fight Nicky Holson, who's the number one guy in the world from Holland. Um, and they, uh, I got kicked in the head and, and stopped. But just the fact that I got in there again, uh, I, I was done. 
and then I, I didn't think I'd be able to run or train or kick anymore. And to, to be able to, to, to get into the cage and, and, and compete again was like a, a second lease of life. So it was, um, yeah, it, it brought all the, um, yeah, the, the opportunities again. So, because once you're done, it's, um, it's so heartbreaking. When you, when you have to retire out of your own terms, it's, uh, there could be so much more potential that you'd never realize unless you, you get in there. So, so now that my hips are uh, recovered, um, I plan to have one more fight. I'm, I'm 45 years old now. Um, I have a few little uh, uh, nigglies that uh, my body's starting to hate me. Um, and I've got to come to the terms of the fact that I'm, I'm not 20 years old anymore. Uh, I'm getting become an old man. So I'm turning into the, the, the Amanda Holyfield of Muay Thai. <laughs> so, you, yeah, you don't look it, to be honest. You look very yeah. young for fighting 20 years, honestly. Um, yeah. so, so I talked to Mr. Chattery from One Championship only recently. And he said, what about a farewell flight? It's like, ah, damn it. Okay. <laughs> so hopefully, 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 hopefully I'm going to have some news soon where um, I think I'm going to have time for one more one more uh, goodbye fight and uh, this will be it. Um, I have to come to the realization where I'm, I'm, I'm old, 45 years old, way too old to be fighting these 20-year-olds. So um, as much as I love it and as much as I wish I could fight forever, it's just reality where... Um, business is going well, the gym is going well, seminars are always packed. Um, so I can, re- I can rely off my, my, my name now instead of having to, to compete um, every month. So, yeah, it's heartbreaking because as much as um, you, you, you can't get the rush, teaching classes and everything is fun, but walking out in front of uh, 10,000 people, is, there's nothing that compares to it. So I, I'm going to miss the, that aspect of... Um, laying in bed for 10 weeks leading up to a fight and just going through the emotions of game plans and, and, and uh, everything that comes with it. Um, that part I'm going to miss very much because it's been such a part of my life for ever. Um, but, but I'm also excited for the future as well. So, so do, one, do more, you, one more fight and then I'm done. Do you live at all through your children a little bit now that they're starting to fight a little bit? Do you get some of that anticipation and excitement when they go in the ring? Do, or you don't feel fully oh, like this? You do, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see them be successful. Also, um, my daughter's had 27 fights now. Uh, wow. She's been able to fight in Thailand three times, uh, England twice, and Canada once. At the age of 18, she's um, she was 18, fighting. Yeah. She was she was fighting overseas at 16. Um, her first fight in Thailand was in front of uh, 10,000 Thais in a in a park on Thai TV. So oh, wow. to, to 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 overcome the 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 fear fighting in a different country in front of all the, the opposition and to win. Um, it, was, it was so amazing. And so, so uh, yeah, to see the happiness, it was, it was so humbling. It was so cool. Um, but yeah, but even, even though the, the kids are successful and um, my fighters are successful, yeah, these, like I said, you can't, you can't bottle that rush of walking out in front of that crowd for yourself. And I'm um, hearing that bell ring and then it's almost like wearing blinkers. You don't hear the crowd. You don't see the crowd. You, all you see is your opponent. And then uh, once the final bell rings, it seems like the world opens back up again. And then you start noticing the crowd and you start hearing the cheering. Um, mm. you just puts you in a different zone to, compared to just being in the corner and yelling out the instructions. So, um, so who's your opponent going to be? Is it going to be under one? Uh, one championship, yes. Uh, okay, I've got great. five more fights with them. So uh, I think I'll have one more. And then um, it's time to call the day. So it's uh, as much as I don't want to, I just have to come to the reality where it's uh, I have no other chance. To, uh, especially my body is starting to fall apart. Uh, I had hip replacement. Um, yeah, it's just um, we'll be yeah, rooting for you, Mike. And I'm not Leo. twenty years old anymore. So. Leo, can you biohack John real quick? Let, let's get get yeah. him a stack right now. Let's let's keep them yeah. together. Let, let's get him yeah. one, you know, one big fight. Maybe give him two more if he wants it. After that, let, yeah. let, what about BPC one five seven? Is that something that, that that's effective? Yeah. Well, I don't uh, know. I mean, I, uh, to talk about, uh, I don't know what aches he has, but just just for information, Mike, the hip replacement is a really interesting replacement because it lasts very long. Usually, a hip replacement he can probably function very well with, but if if you're talking about like inflammation and pain from joints and stuff like that, there are things you can do just supplements not drugs that will reduce uh, a lot the amount of pain you feel like for example if you use fish oil at a low dose like normal people do two grams a day it won't do much but if you use eight grams or ten grams you will notice less joint pain within two or three days everybody does yeah. so there's, there's a bunch of, if you ever want to talk about it, I could send you some suggestions uh, 
my main concern is my hip. Uh, I had the resurface done. So uh, there's there's a steel cap inside my hip socket and then a steel cap on top of my femur head uh, and my road runs. So I can I can spar, kick the pads, do everything uh, pain-free. But uh, majority of my training becomes um, road running from uh, cardio and weight loss. Mm. Uh, and then just that the pounding of the, the hip on the road is just uh, unforgiving. And, and I hobble back into the gym after a run. And uh, I... I I don't feel as confident without my running uh, in my training as I do with, with it. So, um, so that, let's the, talk about the last. The, is your is your hip replacement? Nikki, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry. The last one I had against Nikki uh, on one championship, we do a, a hydration test, and because I wasn't able to do my road runs, uh, my my weight um, didn't fluctuate. It just stayed uh, uh, at eighty, about eighty four, and the fight was at seventy seven kilos. Um, and then uh, when we got to the Singapore, I lost all my weight in the treadmill. Um, I I got down um, perfectly, but I, I failed the hydration test. And the the the, the staff at one they said that even though that you're underweight, um, you have to pass the hydration test before we can check your your weight. So um, like uh, they say, keep drinking, keep drinking, keep drinking, rehydrate again, and then once you pass, then we'll check your weight. So I ended up drinking six liters of water before uh, I finally passed. And then by that stage, I was overweight and ended up costing me uh, $15,000 to my opponent. So okay. I was like, ah, ah, that, 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 that was worse than the head kick. I'd rather get kicked in the head again than lose $15,000. Yeah, well, well, John, I, I work with Eddie Alvarez, who fights over and won, and Eddie brought me in yep. because of the hydration test. I sent you a tweet or a message on, on your public board. The hydration test is, is and I, I joke around being a, a wrestler, I say a 13-year-old high school wrestler in New Jersey can beat one's hydration test right now. I can certify a high school athlete like a within alien solution? 20 pounds. Well, it's a matter of the hydration test really, what it does, it, it tests the hydration of the bladder, not the hydration of the athlete. It just makes sure that your, your, your urine, urine is clear, if you will. So we'll, we'll talk about this stuff offline. But John, I'm happy as a friend to, if, if I can get Johnny Hendricks to make 170 pounds, I can certainly help a very dedicated John Wayne Parr to pass one's hydration test and compete at world-class levels. But also I'm a hip replacement candidate myself. Amen. And I, 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 I moved to the beach so I can run. I get here and I can't run because I got you know less than two millimeters of space left. So what we can do is we can help, I can help just offer suggestions to you on protocols to get your weight down rapidly in a healthy manner, improve body mass, improve cardiovascular output, just do the whole thing using a scientific approach where you don't beat the shit, because I'm 45 also, you don't beat yourself up anymore, get your weight down through, through nutrition. Mm-hmm. And then work on the cardiovascular just through through maybe an elliptical is, is something that, you know, we'll talk about passive ways that don't have that that force impact because that's the shock wave. That's the problem. Right. And you don't want to yeah. go in for another hip. You don't want to get, you know, going. So that, that's a whole nother conversation. I work with a lot of athletes, former NFL athletes and whatnot also um, as an aside to this conversation. Wayne, is your hip replacement uh, ceramic with uh, metal or is it do you know? Yeah, it's, it's the resurface, the Birmingham resurface. So it's a, it's a steel cup with a steel cap. Ah, so it's both metal. A, okay, there's ceramic on yeah. metal, there's metal on metal, there's ceramic on ceramic. You know what's interesting? Yeah. This is what happens. When you do that, when you go jogging, the, the ball inside moves around in the socket and causes yeah. tiny bits of the material. I've, I've actually looked into research papers on the subject. Tiny bits of the material break off, like the metal, will break off and eventually gets into your bloodstream. Your immune system thinks you have a foreign body in you, like a bacteria or something. So it sends out your immune system soldiers to try to neutralize the damage. So that's actually how hip replacements start getting painful and start the, the immune system starts focusing on the area. It's by those little bits of metal or ceramic breaking off. So you can yeah. do things to, to, to tell your immune system to pay less attention to it also. Anyway, we could talk more about this offline, but uh, when I really just have to thank you for coming here. It was such an honor for me. I have like 40 more questions for you on different topics that are way more interesting than the ones I asked, but I wanted to know your background a little bit, so hopefully we can get you on another time so we can talk about more okay. different topics. Like we didn't even talk about CT. We didn't talk about weight cuts. We didn't talk about, there's so many other subjects. Yeah, nice. I hope you yeah, can do it again. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to have come and have a chat. It was, uh, I'm, I'm very humble from a little kid from Australia to be able to chat to you gentlemen. So thank you so much. We're the humbled <laughs> ones. And we're, uh, I'm sure the audience will be very inspired by your story. Thank you so much, Wayne.
Well, hopefully hey, we'll live in contact you, soon. All right, Mike. I'll talk to you soon. Have a good weekend, Mike. Bye, bye guys. Right, bye, John, bye, guys. thank you, brother. Hey, thank bye you bye. so much. Thank you. Bye.